Okay, good morning, everybody. Let's start uh, this uh, webinar. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Bart Gans. I am a leading researcher at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. Uh, today's webinar is the second installment of a series of um, events in the context of a project that we are running on connectivity at FIA. And I would like uh, every, I would like to uh, encourage everybody to take a look at the FIA website for uh, some more information on the project and on its outcomes, uh, including uh, publications. Now, uh, within the project, we have not been paying so much attention to digital connectivity. So uh, I think that these uh, webinars offer us a very good chance to shed some more light on some of these uh, less studied issues, let's say, and certainly uh, critical infrastructure in the realm of uh, cybersecurity is uh, one of those uh, issues. Now, today's uh, webinar will focus on uh, submarine fiber optic cables that are obviously uh, fundamental for the functioning of the global internet and that uh, transmit over 95% of international uh, data. In particular, we'll take a closer look at transarctic undersea cables that can potentially uh, connect Asia, Europe and North America. And they are uh, of great interest because they provide a shorter distance than those running through, for example, the Suez Canal or the Strait of uh, Malacca. And they also offer a faster speed of data transmission. Now, thinking about this topic, um, I think two questions come to mind immediately. First of all, what is the state of play with these uh, cables? What are the opportunities as well as the obstacles in the development of these uh, infrastructure projects? And then secondly, what are the ramifications of these projects for a number of other fields? And just think about the uh, business side of things or the impact on um, the indigenous peoples, local communities and so on, or then the opportunities it offers for science and for uh, academic cooperation, for example. But obviously also uh, security is probably uh, one of the biggest attention grabbing uh, fields, especially because the Arctic uh, region is gradually turning into a global choke point uh, as for uh, these uh, data cable projects. There are the obvious risks of uh, disruption, not only through national disasters or anchor damage, let's say, but there is also the risk of uh, sabotage as part of the so-called hybrid war. And we only have to think about the uh, incident of about a year ago um, in the sabotage of the data cable connecting Svalbard and the mainland Norway uh, to realize the geostrategic risk, let's say, that these forms of infrastructure uh, include. OK, so today we have with us uh, two experts um, on many of these uh, issues. Uh, the main speaker today is uh, Juha Saunavara. He is an associate professor at Hokkaido University in Japan, uh, Hokkaido University Arctic Research Center to be specific. So uh, good evening in Japan. Uh, Juha, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Then uh, our second speaker is uh, the discussant, and that will be uh, Mirva Salminen. And she is assistant professor in societal security at the Arctic University of uh, Norway, uh, located in uh, Tromsø. Um, I suggest that we now move on with the, uh, the presentation by Juha. Um, Juha, please try to keep your talk within uh, 25, max 30 minutes. That will be followed by uh, five to 10 minutes for Mirva for her comments and uh, feedback. And after that, we'll open uh, the floor for questions and uh, answers. And I would like to already uh, invite the audience to uh, type their questions in the chat box uh, already during the course of the presentations. Uh, so thereby, without uh, further ado, I would like to give the floor to uh, Juha now. Juha, please. Bart, Bart, thank you so much. Uh, I hope you can see my, my screen and my slides. Yes. OK. So uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Juha Saunavara, obviously originally born uh, in, in Finland, but nowadays working here in Sapporo. Uh, and today, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm going to talk about transarctic uh, submarine data cable projects. Let's see. 
Yes, it's chasing the slides. So <clears throat> before going to the Arctic, uh, maybe a few words about the uh, care. As a starting point, we can say that the world is not wireless and internet is not in clouds or in space. The satellites are cool uh, and they are clearly needed in sparsely populated areas like uh, like the Arctic. There's clearly need, not sure whether there is enough market, but that's not my problem. Uh, then we still need to understand the scale here. Some, maybe a, a year ago or something like that, I read an article arguing that the total capacity of those 3,000 something uh, low Earth orbit satellites that Elon Musk has put on the orbit, that their total capacity is, is the same as uh, the capacity of one modern submarine fiber optic cable. So they have clearly role to play, uh, but the backbone of the of the international uh, data traffic uh, and this digital infrastructure that we, our societies depend on is still at the bottom of the seas and oceans. 99% uh, of the internet, 99% of all the transocean and digital communications. And what is more, uh, we need, there's a you know, need for new capacity. Uh, the data uh, consumption per capita keeps going up and there's even, uh, there's still new people coming in who start uh, using the internet. At the same time, we need uh, faster connections that uh, in the case of uh, Fiber optic cables, it means that we need shorter uh, routes, shorter distances uh, to make the network latency as short as possible. And here we have a map that it's a delayed geography map describing the current uh, uh, global submarine cable map. Here I would like to point out that the cable you see in the Arctic does not exist. That is the Russian Polar Express cable. I'm assuming that they get their cable in this map because they installed a few, maybe 10, 20 kilometers or something, a small piece of cable near Murmansk. So then the project is no longer planned, but in principle it's considered as, as an pro ongoing project. So that might explain why that, that gray cable is there, although it does not exist. Okay. What we can also see in this map is that this is over concentrated, highly concentrated infrastructure that has makes it uh, it makes it uh, vulnerable both for man-made and, and natural hazards. In many of the choke points that we can easily see in the in the map. Again, we should understand that the fact that we have this kind of map is that there's decisions made by private profit-seeking uh, businesses in you know, different uh, parts of the world in different times. They, there's reasons why they have followed or selected these routes, uh, more about that later. And then another in, important thing to realize that is the international body that would be governing the structure of the, of the network. There's ICPC, the International Cable Protection Committee, but they are just uh, providing technical and legal and environmental information, but they are in no ways uh, covering these matters. Then uh, coming to the Arctic, uh, I took a few quotes from a relatively recent study that was commissioned by Nordunet, uh, that is an international collaboration between uh, uh, national research and educational networks in Nordic countries. So Northern Net commissioned this report from, from Copenhagen Economics uh, about the economic value of submarine cables in the Arctic, uh, what it would mean to, to Nordic countries. And here Northern Net came to the conclusion that there is a need for more resilient infrastructure uh, and, and, and saying that uh, Pointing out the, the existing uh, challenges uh, that that we have in the connections between Asia and, and, and Europe. Uh, again, they came to the conclusion that the Nordic region is an attractive option for strengthening external connectivity, uh, ma mainly this.
uh, and then uh, you know they came into conclusion. You know, uh, as as you can see, uh, this this Arctic cable would boost uh, GDP in the Nordic countries, Nordic regions by more than one billion euro annually if fully optimized. So this all sounds great, but then we have to remember this is not exactly a new idea. And then we could ask why none of the various projects that we have had in the past, you know, none of them have been completed yet. So there, there, there has to be a story behind. In this Nordnet report, uh, they identified different barriers uh, that have prevented these kind of uh, projects in the past. They were pointing to the fact that uh, Building submarine cables in the Arctic entails substantial risks. And, and there's a demand for traffic. Uh, that, you know, the demand that we have in the Arctic, this is an, it would be a new rule. It, it's, it's, it's uncertain. That the uncertainties are greater when you are developing a, a new, new rule. Uh, and then uh, they also pointed out that, uh, you know, if and when these are made uh, primarily as a, as a commercial projects, you know some of the advantages uh, that we could gain through the, the increased connectivity in or within uh, within or, or through the Arctic, they may not. So again, uh, this is the current situation. And the Arctic has been considered as a potential solution because, as I said, the Arctic uh, would offer a shorter route, and the Arctic, uh, so it would be a shorter latency. At the same time, if we go through the Arctic, we could offer or build or construct new diversity, new robustness in the existing over-concentrated uh, cable uh, network. But then why the cables are why, where they are now, uh, th there are different reasons that, that the companies behind are considering. One obvious reason is that when you build something new, you need to connect with the existing global network. And when you have, if you use the old route that is usually used, you have plenty of uh, information available already about the environmental conditions and so on. Again, if you use the old landings, there are many problems that have most likely been solved already, so-called no anchor zones, that there are usually fishery related issues when you are trying to land your cable. There are environmental uh, impacts on the shoreline uh, that may cause difficulties and so on. Again, uh, the maintenance of the untested routes may be more expensive, not least because the ships, that there are only uh, uh, a limited amount of ships capable of correcting uh, cable damages if if something like that happens, and they are usually located uh, near the areas where we have choke points, where we have plen plenty of many cables in close proximity with each other. Again, the the uncertainty concerning the market demand, uh, and again, you know, even if if people in the industry recognize the need for diversity, and they don't want to build something that they would consider a backup system. So that's that's uh, different reasons uh, why we are in a situation where we are at the moment. And then going to the Arctic, I, I will go through really fast uh, uh, these earlier projects. We could start this story from 2000s or something like that. Uh, Rotax, uh, Russian optical trans Arctic submarine cable system, planning to connect uh, uh, Tokyo. Uh, with uh, well, sometimes it's called London, but basically from Tokyo to Northern Europe, uh, they received funding, they received permissions, they conducted some studies. Uh, project was never materialized. Uh, finally, ended in at least in, at the time of the annexation of Crimea. They had a cooperation deal with the Russia uh, with the U.S. partner, and and then that came to an end. So that was then Rotax was the best known, uh, you know, uh, from this early plan to go through the Northeast Passage. Then uh, Arctic Fiber from Canada was uh, 
a company planning to build a cable planning to connect Tokyo and London through the Northwest Passage. Arctic Fiber had the plan, but they could not find money or funding. But they merged with Quintillion uh, Subsea Holdings, that is an uh, Alaska-based company. Quintillion found the money. They managed to compete, uh, complete the phase one, that is the regional system in Alaska. Uh, new uh, submarine cables and, and then some terrestrial parts. And in Quintillion's uh, plan, they, they, their phase two used to be from Japan to Alaska, and then phase three was from, from Alaska to London. Unfortunately, when collecting money uh, and, and, and finance uh, to their phase one, the former uh, CEO committed a fraud, she was jailed, and, and obviously that uh, Stop the, the project. They had to find a new leadership that came from US. Uh, many of who, the person's uh, new leadership has background in US military. Uh, since then, they have at, you know constructed a, a, a ground station for you know uh, satellites in cooperation with Atlas and so on. They have openly uh, talked about the importance of of this uh, digital infrastructure of their cable uh, systems, importance to the US national security needs in the Arctic. Uh, to some, to, to the extent that it, sometimes it's difficult to see whether this is a, a commercial project or, or, or what is the primary function of this project anymore. Uh, the, the discussion concerning uh, connection from, from US to Japan, I, I did not see any any you know, advance or any movement there in, in a few years. But uh, last uh, August, uh, last autumn, they hired a new person to uh, to, to activate and, and lead the plan to uh, connect uh, from Alaska and, and from, uh, from the West Coast to Japan. But uh, no announcements have been made recently. Then what we know well in, in Finland is Arctic Connect, uh, used to be called Koiliskaapeli in Finland and in Finnish. Uh, uh, this story, uh, going back to the Ministry of uh, Transport, uh, and uh, sorry, uh, Ministry of uh, Communication, uh, then a Finnish uh, company called Sinia, mainly state-owned company, took the lead. Uh, Sinia found partners from uh, from well, Norway, uh, from Finland, from Japan, from Russia. The most important thing was to find the Russian partner. That was Megaphone. With Megaphone and, and these uh, other partners, things were going well. They conducted the first set of uh, seabed surveys. Uh, they, uh, you know, they had these partners from Japan joining the so-called Chinia Alliance. They had the first... Uh, MOU with, with Nordunet. Uh, uh, I, I think it was uh, concerning one fiber pair so that the Nordunet would have been their first anchor customer. And things were going well until it uh, until came the May 2021 when the Russian partner Megaphone suddenly announced that they would like to reconsider. They would like to freeze the project. Uh, why they did that? Uh, uh, they did not officially uh, really comment on. In the Russian media, there was a rumor that it has something to do with the Japanese partner Sosichu not fulfilling uh, what they had promised. But this, uh, this uh, behind this argument is a bit difficult to follow. And for example, Syria was a Japanese partner that was causing the trouble. Most more. Likely, I guess we can say the fact that Megaphone stopped the project in, in, in May 21 has something to do with the fact that a month earlier, uh, Russian uh, state authorities announced that they will have their own project funded by, by governmental sources called Polar Express. Polar Express is, is basically, uh, it con the content is more or less the same that we had in Arctic Connect in the Russian part. So in the Arctic Connect, we had 
uh, fiber pairs going directly from Kirkenes to, to Japan without stopping in Russia. And then we had the Russian part that some fiber pairs uh, would land in, in, uh, in some places in Russian uh, Arctic and, and Far East in places where we have significant industrial activity. And then came Polar Express, uh, and, and it, it is uh, more or less identical with this uh, second part of the, the old uh, Arctic Connect project. It can be speculated that the Metaphone found it difficult to compete against the government-led project. Polar Express, uh, led by Morsa Sputnik, uh, a Russian project of, from uh, near, near Murmansk to, to Vladivostok. Uh, they talked about uh, the idea that, that, that this cable is national project and then they could be separate commercial projects connecting uh, this uh, uh, Polar Express cable system to existing uh, uh, cable systems in the West and in the East. But it was difficult to see in, in the summer of 21, it was difficult to see how, let's say, European, American or Japanese uh, companies would be interested in using uh, a cable, uh, kind of Russian uh, state-owned cable system. And now it is even more difficult to see happening. But then when uh, Stenia, uh System, they did not stop. They 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 were pretty fast to find new partners uh, and also new rules. So now we have a project called Far North Fiber, envisioning and planning uh, a route uh, connecting uh, northern and, and and Western Europe through the Northwest Passage with Japan. This is a collaboration between Senior. <laughs> then there is uh, Far North Digital from US. Uh, and quite uh, soon also Arteria Networks uh, from Japan uh, joined the, joined the uh, alliance. First, there uh, were the MOUs uh, made and, and eventually they, they then formed a joint corporation. And uh, you know, it's uh, something between 17,000 to 15,000 kilometers. It should be ready for service around 26. Cost estimate 1.1 billion euros and so on. They also have a, a first uh, MOU uh, concerning the first anchor customer. That would be less surprisingly Nordunet. Uh, again, Nordunet was active in the Arctic Connect already. Uh, and uh, yeah, they, they in this uh, report, uh, that uh, Northern Commission gave us this statement. Governments can support the development of submarine cable projects indirectly through research and education networks acting as anchor tenants. By underwriting long-term contracts, research and educational networks lower commercial risk, thus enhancing the economic viability of other cable owners. Research and educational networks have ample experience in serving and guaranteeing demand from research educational institutions in cable projects. So, in the in the in the report they commissioned, they kind of proposed something like that, and then uh, nowadays they have moved on with this uh, MOU. One more thing, a uh, project that is going on there is is uh, Borealis. It it is the one. That would offer the offer the shortest route. That is the over the pole idea. Uh, not sure uh, whether it's technically feasible. The per per people behind the project are saying it's possible if we have few icebreakers and a few cable ships and few assisting vessels that we could actually lay the cable over the pole and and make the shortest cable uh, uh, possible. But this. Initially it was discussed, I remember, at least in 2019, 2018, then there was not much, or I, I could found, could not find any references to this project until this Nordunet uh, report came out uh, last year. 
Then when we look at this uh, cable project from, from the Japanese side, uh, here we can see Japanese cable landings describing the over-concentrated nature of, of digital infrastructure in Japan. Uh, it, this is also showing, that the, it, it, the map doesn't show it, but also Japanese data center industry is highly concentrated. Now Japanese government has, has uh, announced a, a, a policy aiming for deconcentration of digital infrastructure and, and uh, you know there is a plan to to build a new cable connection from from uh, uh, from Honshu to to Hokkaido. And if we look this map here and look towards the Japan, we can also see that uh, this uh, new connection between Honshu and Hokkaido could actually be kind of in a way if we split the the far north fiber cable. So that it would land both in 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 Hokkaido and in in, in um, Honshu or Greater Tokyo area. Uh, Hokkaido has been as a region has been really interested in this this Arctic and Trans Arctic projects. Uh, uh, we have many similarities with Nordics, many uh, strong points that uh, that also Nordics have when it comes to data center industry, but but uh, the international connectivity is, is missing. So the Japanese companies who have been involved in these transarctic projects, many of them have connections are based in or are based in, in, in Hokkaido. And when it comes to the question whether we focus on connectivity through the Arctic or, or connectivity in the Arctic, it's fair to say that the Japanese side is obviously more interested in this connectivity through the Arctic. So that they see these pro, uh, projects mainly through the the global metropoles through the Arctic with the shortest possible connection, rather than uh, uh, emphasizing the fact that we need to improve the uh, broadband in, in, in the Arctic, small Arctic communities. Then uh, one thing uh, that has <coughs> recently emerged, uh, well, Borealis project was, was the visioner and now Far North Fiber is also talking about smart cables, meaning that we could also uh, put sensors in these uh, submarine uh, cable systems, and these smart sensors could collect data uh, from from uh, you know from the sea bottom, be it sea currents or temperature or, or seismic activity, whatnot. Uh, a great idea again. The smart cable idea has been there for a long, long time, but the problem is uh, to find funding uh, who could actually pay these things. And then other thing is the uh, regulatory side, the regulatory framework. Uh, if you want to install a submarine cable that is transmitting data, you have certain types of regulatory framework that is apparently pretty clear. But if you then want to install a smart cable that is observing its environment rather than only transmitting data, then uh, the regular questions come much more difficult. And even in the case of, of regular uh, communications cables, these uh, security screenings and also environmental screenings have made the process of installing all, all of this uh, moving on with the new cable projects much uh, lower during the recent years. Usually, <clears throat> the industry has been uh, a bit hesitant towards the smart cable idea, being afraid that you know the, if this you know if the sensors break up, uh, they will break the the cable. Uh, or, or, or then obviously, if there if one of the fiber pairs is used to is used to uh, transmit the data from from the uh, sensors. You know, there's a you know, the commercial actor will lose part of the capacity. So the industry has been a bit hesitant, but now in the case of the Arctic, for example, we have Far North Fiber that is openly saying in their in their homepage that they are they would be interested in integrating these smart cable technologies in their transarctic cable system. Now the question is then, do we, found any, do we find anybody from the academic side who could take the leadership 
and and obviously uh, there's a big question uh, who could uh, finance or fund this uh, this smart cable uh, technologies from the academic side uh, i guess we would talk here about tens of millions of of euros at least but uh, that kind of initiatives they are they are very much uh, going on and for once, I think I managed to keep my presentation within the schedule that uh, I promised. So I will I will stop here. I will uh, I guess stop sharing, and then we will have a commentary speech. Thank you very much, uh, Juha, for this uh, very clear and and also uh, quite comprehensive um, overview of what's going on in the world of this uh, development of these transarctic undersea cab cables. There's obviously quite a lot of um, uh, opportunities there, but listening to you, it's also quite clear that uh, a lot of uh, obstacles remain and uh, that progress overall has been rather uh, slow, including in the the field of these uh, so-called smart cables which is quite a uh, something new at least uh, to me to hear um also uh, it's quite obviously a very technical um topic if you take an isolated look uh, at it but um there are the obvious uh, ramifications as i already said in the beginning uh, in a number of other uh, fields uh, security business people to people uh, and so on so um in the interest of time, I suggest we now move on to the discussant uh, for today, Mirva Salminen, who will give her view um, on this topic and provide some uh, comments and, and feedback to Juha. So, Mirva, please. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, first, I need to say that as coming from the security uh, field, um, my perspectives tend to be a little bit pessimistic. So uh, my apologies for that and so, there, so that there's a bias in what I'm going to say. So what I listed as common challenges, starting with challenges uh, in the cables, is uh, the competition between these different operators, uh, funding agreements about the routes and controls. There's a little bit of utopian thinking on the background, increased tensions in the Arctic, uh, the regulations, different regulative frameworks, but also, for example, uh, general safety issues related to Arctic maritime traffic uh, can also uh, also apply to cable installations and, and, and maintenance. So this a bit like an, an, an overview of, of from my perspective what I was hearing. Now then given the security background of course then my interest is in the security uh, aspects of these cables. And usually the perspectives applied are either geopolitical or geoeconomical then referring to uh, the national resources or then infrastructure development or regional development. Then the what is being secured is the cables themselves, the cable networks or functionality of economy and, and, and particular societies. And then the security threats are seen as uh, tapping of the cables, sabotage as part also mentioned. For getting access to control, for example. Or then the. management and control of these systems and its maintenance tend to be rather challenging. What is uh, less applied usually in the security framework is the everyday digitalization and insecurities that it brings along. So what does this uh, uh, ongoing or envisioned or planned development of the Arctic Cable Network or the Arctic Cables brings to the local communities and populations? Does it actually increase? or does it potentially decrease uh, their security or their uh, participation in society, for example. So what does the development bring to local population? There's a lot, a lot of things that are being promised, but for example, the industries developing around the landing stations uh, often don't require employees or require highly skilled employees, which may not be available in the Arctic. Then there's a question of the uh, question of relevant industries in the Arctic that would benefit from the highly uh, fast uh, connections. And someone still needs to build and pay for the local connection points and the infrastructure. 
Furthermore, uh, land use issues, for example, what these particular areas where the landing stations are being built and uh, planned and built, uh, what these areas have been used for before. So land use issues will come up again, come up again as the question of this increased strategic interest and does it actually increase or decrease security and of populations and other inhabitants in the Arctic. So uh, these are the points that I am kind of why I wanted to bring into this discussion and what does what what they also relate to is the way that uh, the infrastructure development and the Arctic cables are often presented. Uh, the maps are empty. There are not things in the sea and then there are not things on the land. It's just the cables that are there in the center. Then the cables have also been the center of security thinking. But when we put them into context, there are a lot of things living in the Arctic. It's not an empty space, even if it's often seen as such. So the Arctic is usually seen as a terrain that things travel through including data and that it serves the interests of other areas and, and, and um, somebody else's needs. But a, uh, what would this development, what are the promises to the local population and also how feasible they are and, and not only in the terms of security but also how does or does not the potential development of the Arctic cables feature into the current security tensions in the area as well. So these are the comments and the questions that I would kind of throw out there. And I think I managed to do this within five minutes. So thank you very much. This is a very interesting presentation. Thank you uh, very much, Mirva, for these uh, comments uh, focusing on security and also on the, the effect of these projects on local populations. So you are, if you uh, would like to reply, Yes, yes, thanks. I was kind of <clears throat> guessing that this human security related questions that they are they are coming <clears throat> and, and Mirva is <clears throat> correct there that although these companies uh, behind these projects like to talk about, about the great possibilities they could bring in the Arctic about telemets, you know, you know, distant, you know, e-schooling e e and whatnot. It is clearly that these are these are international highways, and then they are in most cases they are planned to land on, only in the places where we have significant commercial activity where there is commercial need. And what these cables could then bring to the people living in the Arctic, uh, especially if in, in in the in Nordic countries, maybe a bit different story. But then if you think these areas let's say Canada, Russia, Greenland, somewhere in between. It depends first, where do they land? And if they land at all, and, and then the second question is, you know, who builds the terrestrial network? And I think that is the thing for the local telecom uh, to do. And, and those things might be a poor business cases. So most likely we need a public sector support to, to develop these terrestrial connections, even, you know, around the, around the uh, landings if they if they land. Landings, I would say, uh, when, when well, obviously Mirva was also referring to this uh, sabotage questions and things like that. We have had a plenty of discussion concerning, concerning, you know, whether or not Russians or Americans can tap or the, these, uh, these cables. Well, it's not that difficult to destroy. The most uh, threatening thing to the submarine cables is, is fishermen and bottom contact trolling. So if you want to destroy this cable tapping, yeah, difficult. Landing station because they are they are kind of key parts of this digital infrastructure and, and you, you can find them with Google Maps and there is not much security around them. Well, some nowadays have uh, landings also have data centers within them. So that, that means that there is a more security present. But then some of the, the landing stations that are 20 kilometers from where I'm now in, in Isikari, you know, you can walk there. There's no security whatsoever. And, and again, you know, I found or located one of them with the help of Google Maps. Uh, then uh, about uh, still about the the local needs uh, is 
I think it's it's a positive sign that when we if, when we compare Arctic Connect and the ongoing far north fiber, in the case of Arctic Connect, we did not really talk about uh, people living in the Russian Arctic. In the case of far north fiber, possibly because there's greater need for the goodwill of the local people, there seem to be greater attention and interest in 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 uh, developing connections in in uh, Arctic Canada and possibly also in Greenland into places that uh, would commercially not make uh, that are commercially not feasible or would not commercially make sense, but but there seem to be uh, a greater attention. But then again, you know, like when, when Quintilian built the uh, connection around Alaska, the, the price that we paid for one new person having a, a, a broadband compared to, and then thinking that the total price of the whole system, you know, the number of pe pe people who received the new broadband and, and the price, you know, that was per person price was really, really expensive. But obviously, it then depends how uh, uh, Quintillion or some other local telecoms then develop the network in Alaska around the, I think there were six, seven places, new places where, where Quintillion uh, land is. So that may obviously happen also in the future if they develop the, uh, the restrial network. Mirva, uh, satisfied with the answer? Yes, I am. Uh, um, these are big challenges that nobody really has a, uh, the right answers to. Uh, one thing that I could bring up in the discussion is uh, we talked about the threat of the sabotage, but in principle, because of uh, the, the Internet then being uh, the main object of being secured, uh, would it actually matter that much if one cable is out because the traffic can always be rerouted or would it be more or are we then actually talking more in terms of economic security because the time would then include uh, increase uh, for uh, automatic stock exchanges for example yeah and that's actually a good point because there seems to have been a lot of discussion concerning the possible sabotage in the context of the Arctic, but if you want to make create a bigger problem, then it would make more sense to have this sabotage in in Alexandria, in in, in Suez Canal, or in Malacca Strait, or somewhere where you have tens of cables with close proximity with each other. So in in that sense, the destruction would be would be even more significant if you do it in a place uh, like 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 Suez Canal uh, rather than you know, targeting towards this one and the only cable in the Arctic. Maybe in the future we will have several cables also in the Arctic, but, you know, uh, if you want to maximize the impact, then it would make sense to, to make something in the place where you have several cable systems. So just to quickly comment on that, so uh, the, the interest towards the cables from security terms would then be more about the effect of potential uh, operation against them, but also like who has actually access and how difficult or easy the access to different cables is. OK, thank you. Um, I can maybe add one question. In the meantime, I would like to encourage the audience to uh, add more uh, questions in the chat box. There's already three of them that we'll come back to uh, very soon. Um, I was myself wondering if you could perhaps say a couple of words about the link between um, these undersea cable systems and, and satellite systems. So what is the um, or um, what is the effect of the development of these cables on satellite systems? Um, or how does the sabotage of, of these cable systems affect satellite systems? Um, I presume these satellites are also necessary to monitor naval traffic in order to um, detect uh, sabotage, for example. So could you say a couple of words about the link between uh, these two things? Yeah, well, obviously, <coughs> satellites and, and these submarine cables, they are, they are high, you know, strongly interlinked. Basically, satellites, they need the ground station. Uh, and then ground stations are connected to the fiber backbone. Uh, so when we have more of these 
polar orbiting satellites now and most likely also in the future that will most likely also increase the need for for satellite ground stations uh, in the north and as said quintillion has also already cooperated with atlas and they have one in in alaska and uh, well most likely we will see them in the future and again it, it, in the although it's there's a temptation to to kind of put them against each other uh, I have heard several times people referring to the system of systems that we need different types of solutions in different different areas so that uh, uh, you know point to point technology like fiber optic cable it doesn't really fit well in an environment like like the Arctic where distances are so so strong then again uh, if if uh, Starlink is promising a uh, uh, fiber-like experience to, to people in, let's say, in, in, in Japan or in, in Helsinki or something like that. If you already have a fiber, you may not need a fiber-like experience provided by, by uh, Starlink or somebody else. And then about the security things, uh, well, again, because they are connected, if you, if you attack against the ground station, then obviously you are affecting also the, the, the ways how we can utilize this uh, uh, or, or, or orbiting satellites. Then again, I'm not 100% sure how many uh, fiber connections uh, different ground stations usually have. So they may have several fiber connections. So if, if one is down, that there's still uh, other uh, backup uh, connections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mirva, do you have something on this topic or uh, do we move on to other questions? I think like kind of keeping this in the Arctic context, it's important to remember the difference of technologies being used now and also in the future for the provision of connections. So yes, the cables are the backbone, but, the, but then there are a lot of different technologies uh, already in use, but also under development that will then serve more of the local needs. And also because you need the ground uh, ground network as well. It doesn't help if we just have the cables. There need to be connections to the cables as well, regardless of what the technological solutions for that is. So it's good to keep in mind the difference. So it was good that you brought up the satellites as well. So it's good to keep in mind the uh, difference in technologies and how m much it actually matters, especially in the Arctic. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's move on to the questions from the audience. There is a couple already. Uh, maybe we can pair them, uh, start with two. Uh, first one is about the smart cables. So can these smart cables carry also passive sensors for surveillance, either magnetic or acoustic, towards the detection of sabotage um, actions? And I think the last question was also about uh, smart cables. So can they be used for espionage um, purposes as well? And then perhaps a second question, um, uh, the business side of things, what is the level of interest of big platform companies like uh, Google in these uh, Arctic routes? Yes, thanks. <clears throat> well, that that's, I guess, one of the reasons why we don't see large-scale smart cables at the moment is that uh, if we have our objective is to is to you know study the arctic the ocean or, or something like that we have these sensors acoustic sensors or something like that they can be used both for academic purposes and and according to many there's also a risk that they will or they can be used for military purposes as well so uh I'm not sure whether the military authorities have, you know, stopped any projects or have formally or openly uh, expressed their opinion concerning any ongoing project. But that is one of the most common explanations that comes out in the literature. Why don't we, why we don't have these uh, smart cables? Is that the, the people are afraid of the military authorities' attitude that if we 
our plan is to listen how whales are singing, but then we create a system where we can, you know, uh, maybe detect uh, submarine activity or something like that, that military authorities may uh, be against these kind of systems. That kind of worry has, you know, as it often mentioned in the literature that exists nowadays. Then about the uh, GAFA and, and Google and, and those guys, uh, again, in, in, in the existing uh, transarctic projects, uh, we have only seen uh, official MOU announcements in the case of Arctic Connect and then in the case, now in the case of Far North Fiber, and in both cases, it has been a research and educational network, it has been Nordonet. For sure, uh, they are negotiating, and uh, when uh, different companies are, are showing the advantages that their systems would bring in, they like to show how through the Arctic we could connect, uh, you know, uh, there's a Google data center in Finland or Amazon data center in, in, in uh, well, in many Nordic countries, Facebook in northern Sweden and things like that, and then showing how nicely these Arctic systems could connect them, not only with these same uh, giant tech giants uh, data centers in the in the uh, uh, Japan, but also with, in, within the you know west coast of United States. At the same time, it can be pointed out that. These Google, Amazon, those guys, they have been the leading force of the cable industry development during the recent years. First, they were customers buying capacity. Then they joined these uh, uh, group of companies who were building cables together. And most more recently, they have started building their own companies uh, or their own cable systems. So rather than buying capacity from anybody else, now Google is, is building their own cables. They have not talked about the uh, Arctic. They, they have now connecting North and South America. So, Mirva, your take on these two issues, smart cables and then uh, company interests? Uh, I think you have covered the company interests rather well. So I will just have a quick one on the smart cables. Now, if we just apply kind of a pure strategic thinking and, and then in the, kind of the way that military often uh, approaches things. If we can see the cables, smart cables as, as intelligence collection tools, so as a weapon in that way, then there's always a counter weapon development that a, a people and, and, and states are and the militaries are interested in. So the questions were about uh, cables used for espionage, but also for uh, detecting espionage. So yes, if that kind of development starts to happen or if it's happening at the moment, then 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 I see no reason of why the cables would not be used for intelligence collection or prevention of, of any kind of security threat. Uh, as long as it's within the within or in the borderlines of uh, international law. Mm. Yeah, and uh, certainly uh, international law is also a, a big uh, issue when discussing these uh, cable projects for the future. Uh, okay, two further questions from the audience. Um, one is about the, these cables and the collapse of the internet. Is there actually a risk that uh, the internet would collapse as a result of uh, sabotage or uh, breakdowns? And then secondly, is on the impact of uh, climate change. Climate change increases weather-related uncertainties in the Arctic seas, um, both transarctic and coastal passages. So how does this influence the development of these cables and their operations? Yes, well, if, if we start with the, with the with internet collapse, we have these uh, small uh, island states that have faced the situation if they are only connected with one one uh, submarine cable that you know it's they, they are then in, in, in they have been in a really difficult situation I think some of the islands small islands in the Pacific if we think on the larger scale uh, in uh, 311 uh, when we had great Tohoku earthquake in Japan the uh, there is, I think, more than 10 cable connections connecting Japan to North America. And almost all of them follow the same route. 
and this route was uh, greatly affected by by the earthquake on 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 the you know uh, outside the you know uh, for query and in that case uh, i think all but one of those cables connecting japan and united states they were they, they were broken in one way or another so people who who were working in these issues back then have said to me that we were not that far from the situation that the uh, internet in, in 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 Japan would have, you know, if not stopped or collapsed, you know, faced uh, as a really serious challenge. But but then again, obviously, Japan is rooted from you know uh, other ways, all the way through through Europe to North America. So that route is still there. Uh, but you know, uh, to reroute all that traffic uh, is 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 a major. A major a problem. And about the environment uh, question, it reminded me. I think a few years ago, was it in? Oh, it was one of the bigger, bigger, bigger newspapers in the US. There was this headline saying that the internet is is sinking or internet is destroyed. So basically, these uh, submarine cable stations and this kind of infrastructure, it is on the coast. And then uh, somebody had made uh, a study, uh, kind of predicted uh, a certain type of sea level rise, uh, and, and then came to the conclusion that you know, in the North American side, you know, half of the landing stations, uh, you know, will sink, and, and and that was kind of the warning sign there. So uh, global warming clearly a problem and a threat to all infrastructure located in the coastal areas. Most likely a greater threat to the old existing infrastructure that has been built uh, years or decades ago. Again, if and when in the case of Arctic, we don't have that kind of landing infrastructure at the moment. If we will build that, then those questions will most certainly be taken into consideration. Yeah, um, Mirva. Two further notions. Uh, I think one of the questions to start with is that who would have an interest in, in, in collapsing the internet, in collapsing internet? We are all to an extent uh, dependent on it nowadays. So one of the, uh, in, in, in literature, one of the reasons for um, no major terrorist organization ever having carried out a successful uh, attack on, on, on the internet has one of the explanations for it has been that their operations are so dependent on it as well. So, of course, Russia, for example, has now the attempt to disconnect from the global Internet, but still sustain uh, connectivity within the territory of the uh, of the Federation. So there we can see as one of the um, moves towards trying to secure connectivity, even if uh, there is no connection to the Internet or if the Internet is down or so. But I think the most important question here is that who would actually have the interest towards it. And then about climate change, I think also that the effect may be even more drastic or even more drastic on the connecting infrastructure uh, in the Arctic. So that brings data to the cables because of uh, 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 thawing uh, permafrost and, and, and what kind of effects that has, for example, on existing infrastructures and so forth. So the general laws of climate change affecting infrastructure can apply to, uh, to the digital infrastructure as well. So this would be my final comment on this. And, and if, if I may add, also in the this fiber of the cables usually have pretty limited direct impact on the environment, but we have these examples of, of throwing permafrost causing problems in, 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 in Alaska Highway, they were installing cables and then taking the topsoil out for the sake of installing a, a, a fiber optic cable. And then the fact that we installed the cable caused problems and, you know, uh, the topsoil was removed and then the permafrost was was uh, was melting, and and kind of threatening the 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 basis of the of the highway itself. Okay, um, there's one more question from the audience. It's probably more of a a comment by uh, Frank Juris. Um, 
Distributed acoustic sensing technology enables already now the use of fiber optic cables for underwater surveillance without impacting the cable system data transfer capabilities. To make it simple, the non-smart or so-called stupid cables can also conduct already underwater surveillance. Do you have any um, uh, remarks or observations uh, about that? And then perhaps I can add one uh, final question myself. Um, because I think this is one of the, the few seminars where uh, China has not been mentioned yet. So um, to what extent does this, this topic, the development of these undersea uh, cables play into the so-called great, great power competition that is uh, ongoing globally? Does it play a minor role or is that uh, role increasing? And I'm asking that also because um, when you th if you think, for example, about the uh, relations between uh, Japan and China, uh, they have been quite, let's say, strained um, in, in the past uh, decades, perhaps. Um, but at least some years ago, the Arctic seems to have been a, an exception there. So there was still some kind of uh, cooperation between Japan and China in the realm of, uh, uh, of Arctic research, for example, Arctic um, uh, science and technology. So um, are there possibilities there for cooperation or is that totally out of the question and is are these uh, cable projects indeed uh, an increasingly important element in the ongoing uh, great power competition? Okay, if, if I first try to say something for this, uh, not that familiar with the ways how we can use these stupid cables uh, to conduct underwater surveillance, uh, but I know that they are also, uh, the smart cable system uh, kind of proposes that we will put sensors in these cable systems. There are also other things, other ways of, of doing academic research. Uh, in in, in uh, I think it was in science a few years back, there was this, they explained how the cable itself could be the sensing element if we put lasers at the both ends of the cable system. And in a way that we could uh, study for the seismic activity uh, without putting any sensors in the cable system itself. If we can study seismic activity, well, uh, that may open also a ways to, to study other kinds of movements at the bottom of the sea. Maybe Mirva has more to say about this thing, but then about China. Uh, uh, in the early stages, let's say 2017 and things like the 2008, at least in 2017, there was a lot of discussion concerning Arctic Connect and, and, and China, and, and it was Japan, China, possibly South Korea as, as potential landing stations or areas where we land. But China disappeared uh, uh, pretty fast from the discussion. Uh, there was, and there are these uh, problems with, with Huawei and so on. So uh, it was Arctic Connect uh, since 2000, let's say 2018 or 19 or something like that, and the Far North Fiber, they only talk about Japan. One reason is also the fact that there are uh, extensive connections between the East Asia. You know, there are fiber connection, fiber connectivity between Japan and China. Also, it already exists. So if if one wants to build Arctic uh, connection, it's not necessarily necessary to go to this competitive uh, market. Rather than you just you know, land in, in in Japan, that is. The first one that you 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 land when you come from the north, and then you connect with the existing network. Uh, so uh, China not being that much on the agenda. Then, if you think the Polar Express, this uh, Russian project, if they are seriously thinking of having some kind of international element in in in, in their project, some kind of commercial project connecting this Russian state-owned uh, cable system with some other cable system in the in the Vladivostok. Again, it's difficult to see Western or Japanese uh, companies investing. Uh, most likely, Chinese uh, investors might be the, the only ones that I can see at the moment showing any kind of interest in developing such kind of international cooperation. Then when it comes to smart cables or something like that, well, uh, I have not heard about these the issues, but we know from the past that China has been active and ready to invest significant amount of money to develop uh, uh, 
research infrastructure in the Arctic. Uh, so that might be possible, but that's something that I have no information at this moment. Okay, thanks. And uh, Mirva, you will get the, the, the final words. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I think I will be even shorter with with my comments on on, on the cables because I don't uh, how to say this uh, without doing any further uh, speculations about what the current cables can do or cannot do. Then, then, then I would just say that the comment kind of verifications are uh, speculations about the smart cables. So again, the same logic, this way, say, same way of thinking, kind of is there on the background or can be used or can be applied uh, regardless of uh, what the what the infrastructure or what the technology is or what the interests are. Uh, quickly about uh, China, this is not, definitely not my area of uh, specialty, but I would say that uh, regardless of who the player is, there is clearly interest in the speed of communications, but also interest in the infrastructure construction, maintenance and renewal, because that again provides a certain kind of strategic opportunities for those who are uh, in these deals and, and, and have access to the networks. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, the time is up now and uh, it's time to, to close the seminar um, um, on this very, um, at first glance, very technical issue, but um, it has such a myriad of, uh, of very important and, and also very interesting uh, implications and ramifications. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, both uh, speakers uh, for joining us from Japan and, and from Norway. And also a big thank you to the audience. And I hope to see you again either uh, through a webinar or um, maybe who knows in a live seminar on the next occasion. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, seminar is now closed. Thank you. <laughs>